Let's look at number eight, 60 year old female with a 3.5 centimeter mass of the lower extremity. I guess that would mean the leg, wouldn't it? And in fact, oh, we didn't tell you, but oh, I remember this one. This is particularly challenging because it's actually in bone, isn't it? We probably should have told you that. This is in the, the bone on the uh, foot, if I, if I remember correctly. The, I think it was in the calcaneus. But, but don't worry about that because this is not a, usually a bone thing. It's just something that happened to be in bone this time. Did you figure out what it was? Uh, after looking at this and picturing myself in a different part of the body, like a lymph node, uh -huh. I thought it was um, just an extra nodal rosy dorsum. Nicely done, yes. But and you stuck with that even though you saw bone there and you thought, well, I guess I mean, what else can it be, right? right? Good. This is a really nice example of something that's rare that you can occasionally have rosy dorkman occur in the bone as like a lytic bone lesion. I've seen it a few times um, uh, so far in training and in practice. And uh, this is a pretty nice example of it. So, you know, that goes back to when something, when everything fits for one diagnosis, but except, well, it's a weird spot or there's one weird feature. Well, it probably still is the thing that most of the features point to. And I think that's the one hard part of pathology practice is you will want everything to fit what it's supposed to be in the book. But oftentimes there'll be one or two features that are kind of strange. And a big part of the struggle of everyday practice is, is that weird enough that I need to think of something else? So, and when you do consult work, that's a lot of the consults you get is, I thought this was this, but I found a mitosis or I found an atypical cell or whatever. And it's people just needing reassurance that, oh yeah, the Fs can be massive or, oh yeah, you can have Rosi Dorkman in the bone. So this is... Uh, Rosi Dorfman, extranodal Rosi Dorfman, involving the bone. Let me see if I can find a good, uh, good area to show you here. So when you go looking for imperipolesis, the problem is you're never going to find a place that's good enough like to take a picture of for a textbook. And the problem is that there's imperipolesis actually everywhere we look here. See all these cells here? They're all sitting in the cytoplasm, but they're not that like perfect little vacuole that you want to see in the book. So I feel like imperipolesis is over relied on. It's really pretty, but um, it's not really like needed for the diagnosis of Rosi Dorfman. What you want to find, what I'm trying to find, is a really good example of the cytologic features. Okay, so here's an example. What, the thing I really want to find in Rosi Dorfman, well, for one thing, from low power, it's sheets of pale pink cells with little aggregates of blue. So pink and blue from low power. And that is, and usually you go see it in the subcutis when it's extranodal. In the node, it looks kind of totally different actually because it fills up the 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 um, what are those things called sinusoids? The sinuses. Thank you. Um, I was like, you know, those empty things in between. That's, that just shows how little heme path I do. So um, yeah, but in the soft tissue, it makes a mass, usually sheets of these pink cells of the abundant cytoplasm and little aggregates of lymphocytes and plasma cells. The bone, it kind of does the same thing, although it can be a little bit altered because of the damage it makes to the bone. And in here, we're seeing some of those big cells with abundant puffy cytoplasm. They usually have large round nuclei, often with central prominent nucleoli, like this guy right here. And also, we got lucky too, because you can actually see some nice imperipolesis, if I can get it in focus here. See there? Here's the tumor, or the nucleus of the histiocyte, and there are some little cells, little white cells in there. There's a couple right here, and there's the, the, the histiocyte. You can see this little neutrophil. Well, all the stuff that's pink here we're seeing is cytoplasm. So that neutrophil is in the cytoplasm. You just don't see a nice vacuole around it. If you really want to see the nice vacuole, you can do, well, what, what stain will highlight these histiocytes? S100. S100, right? And occasionally you can see S100 in other histiocytes too. So by itself, S100 positive doesn't prove something's Rosi Dorfman. Um, and in really classic cases, you don't honestly need it, in my opinion. But I do feel like S100 will often highlight the cytoplasm enough, so the little vacuoles that the imperipolesis, the little, and for those of you watching this, imperipolesis is basically the when white blood cells, either neutrophils, plasma cells, lymphocytes, sometimes red cells even, they get inside um, the cytoplasm of these big histiocytes, and they kind of float there in vacuoles. And they're not being destroyed or eaten. It's not like hemophagocytosis. It's just there, I think Adam Bagg, a, a really funny and excellent heme path teacher, he once said they're, they're just stopping by for tea. You know, they're just kind of coming into the cytoplasm and then, then I guess leaving. I don't know if they really leave. Oftentimes you see plasma cells. I just saw them and then I moved past it because my, my uh, fine motor skills aren't very good, I guess. But all of these... All of these plasma cells, plasma cells are almost always present and usually abundant in Rosi Dorfman. 
But what you really want to find more than anything is these big nuclei. You should have really large big nuclei with pale chromatin and prominent nucleoli and a bunch of cytoplasm. That's the cell of Rosi Dorfman. And that's what we have here. I would say one unusual feature in this case is the fact that there's a bunch of foamy cytoplasm. That is not something I typically see in Rosi Dorfman. And I suspect some of that here is due to like breakdown of the bone with some hemorrhage and, and the fact that it's in the bone making a lytic lesion that's destructive to the bone in this case. So I suspect that that's why, because there's some hemocytorin and some foam cells. So I imagine that's from bleeding and then the lipid getting taken up. Um, and some of these probably are not actually tumoral histiocytes. They're just background um, foamy histiocytes taking that up. So I think that's a little bit unusual feature. Um, but anyway, this was a pretty interesting case. And this was S100 positive, I, although I don't know if I still have a picture of that or not. But so a good thing to keep in mind, other things to keep in mind in the bone, when you see a bunch of foamy cells like this, you can think there's a really rare disease called Erdheim-Chester disease that can give you a bunch of foamy histiocytes in the bone. And the unusual thing about that, and I've actually never yet seen a real case that I, not that I know of at least, is they often have bilateral like mirror image lesions. Like they'll have lesions in the same bone on both sides of the body. Really weird, right? At least that's right. what I've heard. And from the limited reading I've done on it, that's what the, the supposed history is. So... I've seen something very rare, Rosi Dorfman disease. And when it's in a lymph node, we call it sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy, although obviously that name does not apply outside the lymph node because that wouldn't make any sense. So in, in the bone, Rosi Dorfman of the bone. And I do have a, another video about regular external Rosi Dorfman on my YouTube channel. All right.